All right. Who's glad that Jesus Christ was born? Man, it's, I just, I guess I've been reflecting on Christmas because it's that time of year, I suppose. And um, you can't get used to the idea of the God of the universe coming down into something this big, yet still remaining the God of the universe. Like, I, I struggle with that, but it's so amazing. The gratitude that we have when we, think about these things more and more. The extent that he went to to be with us is something that we'll probably only fully understand when we get to the other side and see with unveiled faces what he really is like. And this song is talking about the gratitude. My words fall short because i got nothing new. Every year we hear the same story and we're learning more, but our language just falls so short of what he deserves how could i express my gratitude you may not know this one but um follow along it's pretty cool heavenly father how would we show our gratitude you've given us eternal life through the gift of your son what an amazing sacrifice in the years that he was here after being for all eternity in the highest heavens having everything the Lord Almighty could ever desire or want. Yet something within you wanted a relationship with a human being like us to become one yourself. We cannot comprehend. So we thank you in the only way we know how to This morning we sing songs dedicated to you. We quieten our minds and our hearts of the stresses of the the year, that these next coming days will be focused upon the story that you came to us. And this is the, the easy part of the mission, the beginning. It probably wasn't easy for Mary and Joseph as we look at all the story. And all the angels in heaven said, what is he doing down there? And why does he look like that? And why is he in a feed trough? This is not fitting for the king of the universe. So whatever we can do to understand that more fully and respond in some way to give you the glory and give our lives to you over these days, we ask that your Holy Spirit shows us something new this year that the Christmas story may mean more to us and more to those that look at our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we just reflect on the story and look at some of the words soon, of a very old song that someone wrote a couple hundred years ago, the story never changes, but it only develops more as we understand it more deeply. We thank you for those that have gone before us and passed the story on to us through the scriptures. We know that you've protected your word so that it remains uh, accurate to us. We thank you for those that have given their lives to protect what we have in the word. And we thank you for uh, the old hymns and the faithfulness. Those that lived hundreds of years ago didn't have what we have as the resources to understand and learn about you so we pray that that's our heart Lord that we will know you more as you reveal yourself to us we pray this morning for those that are not well or perhaps lonely or have family struggles relationship issues we as your church Lord offer ourselves to give ourselves into those situations to humble ourselves to forgive each other to say we're sorry Serve those that may not be doing so well. We pray for Big Max down in hospital there that you'll restore his health fully, that he may get home back with his family soon in the, in the next coming days. For others that are struggling, Lord, we, 
We want to know about them that they may not suffer in silence, that your church may be used in this season. That no one would have Christmas Day alone. That we will share our food and the abundance that we have to care for one another, just as you would have us do. Amen. Okay, so we're going to do something a little bit different. There's not, there's a couple of passages of scripture, just a few verses here and there, but I've actually taken a really old hymn, which is a Christmassy hymn. And we're going to go through the words to that as part of the message today. So the hymn t- today we're looking at is the one we're going to sing next. So you don't know what it is yet. Uh, Angels from the realms of glory. So that can come and go. From, I don't, if we put that on the screen, that probably takes it off the video. Does it? Doesn't? Okay. All good. Don't worry, Rondo. I just don't know what I'm talking about. Doesn't matter. There's a fella named James Montgomery. Have you heard that name before? <coughs> He's a pretty influential. He was actually a journalist, but he wrote some really cool poems that became songs and hymns back in 1800s, like 1816. He'd been in jail twice for some of the um, newspaper articles he put in. I'm not sure exactly what that meant but um, the big guys didn't like it so they put him in jail to try and quieten him down but there was no controversy when he wrote this poem and he put it in the newspaper one day and this is the poem that we're about to look at on Christmas Eve he put it in the newspaper so today in 1816 this went in the newspaper over there in London and then another guy Isaac Watts um Oh, hang on, no, he's another guy that wrote lots of songs. I don't read him. It's him and Isaac Watts, James Montgomery and Isaac Watts wrote a heap of these hymns over there and, and, and songs that we now sing. He championed the cause of the poor. So he wasn't just a journalist, but he, he pushed the boundaries. And this is probably what got him into trouble because he wanted to help those who were homeless and had, had nothing. And maybe that's what he wrote about in his newspapers, like... You big fat cat guys need to get out and do some things with what you have because you're keeping it all to yourself and got in trouble. The downtrodden and also his foreign missions he was interested in. But it's really cool that this song and the way that we sing it, hopefully we sing it right in the right tune, was written by a blind organist named Henry Smart. Have you heard that name before? Well, he was so smart, this Henry, that he would build organs and he was blind. I don't know how you do that. That's, I'd love to meet these guys. But he put the music to this song as we now know it. In this song, he refers to the gospel accounts of Christ's birth, but also some of the messianic prophecies. Now, do you know what messianic means? No, it's not just what Max's room looks like. This is about the stories or the verses or the scriptures that tell about Jesus before he came. So when you get to the end of the Old Testament, you've got some minor prophets. They're little short ones that they're easy to skip over. There's a heap of little stuff in there that would have made sense a bit to the prophets at the time, but they make more sense to us when we look back at the time of Jesus. And we're going to have a look at a couple of those today. Right, eh? Straight into it. Verse, first verse. Angels from the realms of glory. Stop there on that line. Would you love to see where the angels hang out? Hudson would. I reckon it'd be. This is what I think about at Christmas time. What is it like for where they are? Angels from the realms of glory. They're not just floating around on earth like Casper the friendly ghost. I can't even say that properly. They're in heaven and their main role is to some serve God and some glorify God. Some are in charge of the worship like the cherubims and the seraphims. They're big scary angels with flaming swords. The angel that 
cut off the Garden of Eden from Adam and Eve, like these guys were, if you saw them, you would freak out. And these guys are also continually, to us it sounds a little bit monotonous and mundane that you would just sing glory in the highest over and over again. But however they do it, God's never sick of it and the angels never get sick of it and anyone else looking on is just continually going, can you wait for that? So this part of the story in human history, the angels from the realms of glory wing your flight over all the earth. So they're not just hanging out in heaven anymore. They've been sent on a mission and I bet they were excited about it. You remember that little kid's um, skit we did? Their angels are sitting around and God's there going, I think I'm going to send my lad down. And the angels go, whoa, they won't be expecting that. And, he's, and then they'll be like, well, this is going to be amazing. They're going to just fall on their face because he's going to be, if they see him for who he is, they're never going to be the same. Yeah, no, I'm going to actually have him born in a cow shed and then his mum will put him in the feed trough and it'll be a very humble beginning. And then they're going, okay, I guess they won't be expecting that. And the whole mission was laid out before them. And then they were sent down. Let's go, Michael, Gabriel. I don't know who the rest of the names are. Because the, there was a heap of them involved. The ones who sang creation story. Now, I don't know exactly what this, how this song goes, but it's interesting to me that God existed and, and heaven existed. I don't know how many angels were with God before he thought of inventing the our universe. It's a little bit interesting to me that he existed before we, or anything existed. And he was fine with that, but he, he said, let's do something new. So then there was a time when angels kind of got to sing a story of God's doing something different. He's putting himself and his creativity and his love into something we're going to call the universe. And there's planets and stars and suns and galaxies and black holes and supernovas and, I don't know, Apollo 13s and I don't know, something like that. They sang that story proclaiming his majesty. And the, the scriptures say that the heavens declare the glory of God and the angels were part of that when the creation story began. Now, stage two of their story is when the Messiah was to come as a human baby being born in Bethlehem. In Luke chapter two, we read, and this is something that blows my mind in the way it panned out because it was so small, yet such a game changer for those shepherds who were there. Where are we? Luke 2 from 8 to 14. We'll just read there. There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. We put that in, in carol songs, don't we? And lo, I love that, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone around about them. And they, in this version, were sore afraid. S-O-R-E, this is like the old King James, or new King James. They were sore afraid. They were freaking out, man. Because these angels, it was actually just one angel and they were freaking out. The angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then suddenly the angel goes, and all these mates came, filled the whole sky up. There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace and goodwill toward men. If you reflect on that line, they had one thing to say or to sing, which is something God said, I want you to say this. I don't want you to be there and tell them everything for an hour. I want you to say one line. And in this one line is encapsulated the whole mission. Glory to God in the highest, that's the first thing. He's always been there. Now the angels get to go from there and come down and share some of that up there with us down here. But peace on earth. And goodwill toward men. All throughout human history, that has been the, the opposite to peace on earth. The angels were sent on a mission and God said they need to know that I don't hate them. In fact, I'm starting a plan that they need to understand that I'm coming to make us able to be together. Goodwill toward men. Not just goodwill toward each other, like stop fighting amongst yourselves, little children, but the idea is God is coming with his love to reach us. And those shepherds were the least likely to understand it or to be in the right place at the right time. They were in the middle of nowhere, literally. And no doubt their sheep freaked out and took off as well. That encapsulates the kind of story and the kind of God that we serve, that he would choose the least likely. So if you ever feel like you're not really the person that God would give any kind of attention to, I want you to think again. Because that's what the shepherds would have thought and that's why they were shepherds. They weren't probably even allowed in town half the time because they were not the well-to-do people. They used to sing creation's story. Now they proclaim the Messiah's birth. They were pumped to share this message. And they didn't just sit up there and go, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth. Can you imagine how the excitement they're sharing this message and the subwoofers and the ghetto blasters that accompanied them that created all this atmosphere of absolute celebration and glory. And then the angels went, we better go check it out. Not the angels, the shepherds. The angels knew what was going on. I'll skip the chorus. Well, we can look at the chorus. Between each of these verses, it says, Come and worship Christ the newborn King. That's the invitation. Verse 2. Shepherds in the field abiding, watching over their flocks by night. God with man is now residing. So many of us feel that he's so far away and he doesn't say much when we need him most. The best way to know God is with you is to open the scriptures and, and read how he came for you. How he lived on the earth. He left his heavenly throne. And didn't just leave us again. It wasn't just a 30-something year visit and leave again. He left his Holy Spirit here. We've been talking with this around the campfire even last night about some of the different ideas about Jesus in different sects of religion kind of thing, like uh, Jehovah Witnesses and, and Mormons. And they, 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 they miss something critical here. That Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you alone. In fact, I'm going to come and live with you every single day until I return. And that's the Holy Spirit with us. God with man now residing. Your comforter, your counsellor, your guide, your advocate, the one who keeps saying to the Father, don't worry, this one's covered, he's one of your children. And saying to you, don't worry, you're covered, you're one of his children. Every time you feel like you're not worthy. Yonder shines the infant light. Such a mind-blowing thing that he would come as a baby. 
This one I like, verse 3. <clears throat> wise men. My version says sages. Do you remember my, my talk about the wise men being called a sage? It says, sages, leave your contemplations. Which means a wise man is someone who sits around and strokes his beard, sits at the entrance of a cave on a mountain and, and thinks of the deeper things. Keep working on it, Eli. I think you've got a couple there, but yeah. Keep trying. Concentrate really hard. This is a, a telling the wise men, stop thinking about what you're thinking about because what you're thinking about, even though you've got a big brain, is really small. Sages, leave your contemplations. Brighter visions beam afar. I was thinking about this when... You have the biggest brains, and we, we actually talked about big brains last week, or people that are um, philosophers, they think about the deeper meanings of life. But if they're not using their contemplations through the Word of God, they're just thinking about random things that their brain comes up with, and they may never understand much at all. Trying to discover God by thinking about it, and contemplating it, or using the power of your mind only without the input of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, I was thinking it's like trying to explore and get to know Buckingham Palace by sitting in the cleaner's closet and looking at the corner of the room and never leaving it. Does that sound like an illustration? How do you get to know God if you just keep thinking about it without His insight? He says, the only reason you know me is because I reveal myself to you. And if that's your desire, that you would want to know him, ask him to show you. Because all your thoughts put together are still only a spit in a bucket of who he really is. But the amazing thing about Christmas is that the simplicity of who he is, mixed with the majesty of who he is, is found in the person Jesus Christ. God's like, I need these people who are so little, their brains are like this big. How will they understand enough of me to receive me and have relationship with me? So he sent the perfect representation of the Father, the, his Son, and then the fellowship of the Holy Spirit from then on. The next line here says, seek, this is telling these wise men, seek the great desire of nations. Now this is a line from Haggai, who is one of those little prophets, a um, couple towards the end of the, the Old Testament. Haggai chapter 2, um, verse 7 to 9, I'll quickly read. He says this, this is what he's saying to the prophet, and this is hundreds of years before Jesus came. He said, I will shake all the nations and the desire of all nations shall come. Now that phrase there is actually kind of like a name for Jesus. The one every nation desires deep down, whether they realize it or not, is Jesus. I will send him. He shall come and I will fill this house with glory says the Lord of hosts. He's talking about um, Jerusalem there and the temple. And then this verse I love. When we try to bring him stuff or we offer things that we have, this is a verse you may have heard before. He says in verse 8, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Basically, everything that you could ever offer me is already mine. Were you there before the heavens were created? Before the earth and the universe was created? No. So anything that's created, I created it. So thanks for offering it back to me. It's like your two-year-old doing a squiggle and going, Hey, Dad, this is the greatest thing you'll ever have. But the relationship is what he desires. But there's something more that's happening in this scripture, and if you unpack the 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 book of Haggai, it's telling the story of what things will be like when Jesus returns. The glory of this later house, 
the glory of the time that's coming, the glory of Jerusalem that's going to happen still, and it's still after this, we believe, um, will be better than ever before. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former, says the Lord. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. There's little snippets all the way through these Old Testament um, prophets that talk about something of what Jesus is going to fulfill. And then it's the, the last line of that verse says, Wise men, you have seen his natal star. It's like the star that shows his birth. This really... I find super interesting because the heavens declare the glory of God. We always think of that as they're so awesome and far away and shiny and huge exploding masses of gas. That's how powerful God is and how we should kind of take note and be afraid of him. But it actually, these wise men knew from the time of Daniel in Babylon they knew that when they looked at the heavens, it was telling a story. And they knew the time that he was to be born, the saviour of the world. Now, I also find it very interesting and convenient for the devil that he knows that stars are used to tell stories. So what has he done about it? I don't worry about it telling you about God. The, the stars, you, can, you know, if you're an Aquarius, if you were born in February... You can look at the stars and you can tell what kind of day you're about to have. It's like, hang on, I don't think that's what God meant. There is a general picture of the glory of God that tells his story and our story, how he will come to us and we can be with him. As soon as you flip it around and say, the stars are going to tell my story and dictate my life, you've suddenly slotted God out of the picture and this is where the new age stuff goes into worshipping the stars or reading the star signs in the newspaper and say oh no it says I'm going to have a bad week and meet a dark stranger and my finances are going to be challenged I'm like yeah so that's 12 possibilities in all the world that's everybody's day how dumb are you but there's something about this superstition and this twisting of a reality that the devil uses to take people's eyes off God. So stay away from it, he says. It tells a story of a future glory when Jesus comes. It's his story for you, but it's not about how your day or your week's going to be. Again, the devil knows truth behind this stuff and he twists it just enough to mess us up. Verse 4, here's our response. Saints before the altar bending. Now, we don't have an altar anymore. We got a lectern that was donated. I don't know who donated this one. It's been here a long time. But rarely do we come and bring wild animals into here and, and sacrifice them or or kneel down. Sometimes you may feel to kneel before the Lord in prayer, which is an awesome thing. But when you understand the story of what we've been sharing, it says the saints, so those who have received salvation from Jesus and are led by the Holy Spirit, come to God and they bend the knee. But they don't just stay here and say, oh, I'm just not going anywhere until Jesus comes back. We're watching and we're hoping and we're fearing, and that's not a word we use, but in 1816, it was a kind of a reverence. Paul says, um, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that's not like other religions where you think, I'm really scared that I'm getting it wrong and I'm not going to be saved or go to heaven. It's a different kind of fear. It's I understand what God has done for me. Now I want to respond appropriately and I'm going to do everything in my power to show others what I've received. There's a fear of the glory of God and it's not that he's... It's, it's like we understand his power and his majesty. We don't fear he's going to smash us because we know the gospel and the love of Christ it remains over us. But it means we don't take it for granted. 
We don't take it lightly. Watching long in hope and fear. Hope of the day he returns, but fearing that if he come today, I better be doing something worthwhile. Suddenly, the Lord descending. It's going to happen like, so we better be ready. And in his temple shall appear. There's one more little passage here in Malachi is the second, Oh, it's the last book, actually. Somebody might call it Malachi. The last book of the Old Testament. Malachi was a guy that God spoke to. Malachi 3.1, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you shall seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, He shall come, says the Lord of hosts. There's a day that he's going to come and he's going to sit in his rightful place on the earth and every person, every knee will bow, every eye will see him. Do you look forward to that day? It's really interesting to think that he would return to Jerusalem and we get to visit him there or I don't know, but I know it's going to be great because at the moment God is not, How do you put this? God reigns over all the earth, but at the moment, the prince of the earth, the devil, is having a lot of influence and wrecking a lot of lives. There's coming a day when that will totally be changed and his rule and reign with peace and the saints who are with him and alive at the time and return with him will be reigning with him. I think that's pretty awesome. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. So there's a little bit of insight to someone 200 years ago who thought, this is an awesome story. I'm going to make a poem and put it in the newspaper. And little did he know that in 2023 on the hill in Amamore, someone would be reading it word for word and then we're going to sing it with a full band. Does that sound good? So good on you, Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Smart for putting music to it. And we want to honour those guys for sharing with us the good news. All right, Ben, you better get back up here. So it's Christmas Eve. We pray that you're um, already having a bit of a relaxed break. Don't forget tomorrow... 8 o'clock service, it's an early one, so the band will be here um, earlier than normal. Hopefully we play just as good. But let's sing together as we finish up. I always got this confused with angels we have heard on high, different tune. So don't mess it up or Mr. Smart will be not happy. You've got to stand and get the diaphragm open for this one too. Angels from the realms of glory Wing your flight over all the earth You and creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth come and worship come and worship worship Christ the newborn King shepherds in the field abiding watching all their flocks Residing full of love and life and life. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Wise men, leave your contemplations, is a vision. Desire of nations, you have seen the heavenly light. 
slow this down. The saints before the altar bending, watching long with hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending to his people shall appear. Saints before the altar bending, watching long with hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending to his people shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Heavenly Father, we pray that our lives, our words and our deeds may reflect the words of that song. That we look forward in hope and reverent fear at your coming. That we will also worship you with our lives in ways that others will come to understand that you're real and you're there for them as you've been there for us and will continue to be. So I pray a blessing upon every family and um, extended family represented here today. For anyone listening at home online, um, we just ask that you be with them and may the glory of the Lord be revealed this Christmas through us. Keep us safe as we travel and, and do water sports and eat lots of food, all those kind of things. Bless those who are unwell and use us to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen.